church, we love God. Make no mistake about that. At our church, we believe Jesus is God. We're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. We believe that prayer moves the hand of God, and it's normal for every believer to be intimate with God and devoted to His cause. At our church, we believe the Bible is God's Word. It's real, it's living, and it's active. We believe freedom is the heart of God for every believer, and we value humor, simplicity, teamwork, and a positive outlook on life. At our church, we're about developing great relationships with God, each other, and those in our community. At our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that he really died on the cross, and that he really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and will not water down or candy coat that message, ever. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we're not concerned about where you've been, but where you're going. We believe that all people matter to God, and therefore matter to us. Today, you have chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially life-changing message. Welcome, Welcome to, to our, our church. church. Books to Esther 1 before we get started in worship. That will set you up so then that way you won't have to be flipping that way when we get there. And uh, after Bruce is done, I'm going to ask him to go ahead and come on up <laughs> do his word. Word for today. After today's word, we're going back to the beginning. Genesis. Chapter 15, in verse 6, and this is talking about Abraham. And this is when uh, God had promised him that his descendants would be like the stars in the heavens. And it says in chapter this verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 6, it says, And he believed the Lord, and the Lord accounted it to him as righteousness. Now think about that, I think. God never changes. You know, it's the same way for us. When we believe the Lord, what the book says, mm -hmm. what he's told us. Yep. We're counted as the righteousness of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. And song out right now, I think, uh, well, Warren Dagle sings one of them, but there's another one too that's sung by a hell song. But it, it mm -hmm. says, you know, the, the lyrics are, I am who you say I am. You know, and how many of us go around thinking that we are a child of God? That he does love us, that he has given his son for us. And you know, I, I hear about people talking about they have classes at school, you know, self-esteem and self-worth and everything. And I think, you know, they wouldn't need those classes if they taught these kids who they are. Mm -hmm. You know, when you know how much God loves you, what he gave for you, you don't need any self-esteem. You know, you need humbleness at that point because some of us go around with our chest pooped out and think we're just better than everybody else. No, we're just God's. Yeah. You know? right. And uh, because of that, so, and then that's what's going on in this country too right now is we know who we are, but there are a lot of people that don't know who they are and they don't know who God is. They don't believe God and they're doing things their way and, you know, it doesn't work. If you don't have a base, if you don't have a solid point to put your life on an anchor, you know, the Bible, one song called it, you know, the anchor still holds. That's when people mm -hmm. move around saying things like, Well, it's all right to have sex and not be married. It's all right to be gay. You know, it's all right to worship false gods. And, you know, people say, Well, you just don't believe in that. I'm like, And they say, You know, things like, Oh, you're homophobe or you're, you know, and you're anti Semitism or whatever. It's not, the, it's not that I don't like those people. I love those people. God loves those people. Mm -hmm. But there are consequences when you do things that does not line up with the word. You know, if you read Deuteronomy, there's curses for this and there's blessings for this. You know, there's blessings for obedience and there's curses for disobedience. And when you try to tell people those things, you know, they don't want to hear them. You see what's going on in our nation. You know that the founders of our nation said, if this nation did not stay a Judeo-Christian nation, the laws would never work. They would never stay together. And when you see all these immigrants coming in and they're different religions and everything, you know why our nation's starting to separate and crumble, you know, and, and the things it's going through. 
You know, like I've said before, we do have the power. God lives in us. The Bible tells us that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So we need to be praying about it. We need to be quoting those scriptures. And we need to, you know, I, I think about this. You know, you go from Genesis to Revelation, but in Revelation it says around the king's throne, 24 elders in the, in the rainbow. See, God's got all the covenants he's ever made right in front of him every day. He's got the covenant he made to Moses, or to Noah, the rainbow, never flood the earth again. He's got the covenant that he made to the 12 tribes of, of Israel. That's 12 of the 24 elders. He's got the covenant he made to the 12 apostles. And they're before him all the time. He never forgets. And I've thought about that. And, you know, as much wisdom and knowledge as God had, why would he need to remind her and round his throne all the time? And I'm still not really sure. But I know that when we remind God of his word, it's powerful. It's powerful. You know, we can know it, but the Bible says speak it out. Jesus spoke it out when David Satan was tempted. He said, it's written, it's written, it's written. When we agree with those words, it's very powerful in our lives. So, you know, we have to believe the word, and we have to know the word, and we have to speak the word out. But I have to say, the power is in us as a church. And we can't ever forget that, and we need to use it. You know, we need to use it for each other, and for this nation, and for the world. So, just remember who you are. And I guess that's what I was thinking. You know, the Bible says Abraham knew God, and knew he couldn't lie. He believed him, you know, with accounted to him for righteousness. <coughs> we need to do the same. You know, we are the righteousness of God. And the Bible says that all things will be given to us. Mm -hmm. It's like all things? Mm -hmm. All things? You said we're joining heirs with Christ. All things. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, mm -hmm. thank you. Amen. Thanks, Bert. That was a good one. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of people think, how could God ask Abraham to give his only son as a sacrifice? He can only want that all of them. Well, he knew that God would bring him back to life. He knew he believed him. He knew if he asked him to do the ultimate sacrifice that God would not lie, that he would bring him back to life, and he would be the uh, inheritance of all that. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Father God, as we come before you this morning, we just uh, thank you for life, God. We thank you that you've given us so many blessings. And Lord, we just ask that our worship to you would be a sweet aroma to your nostrils, Father. That we would open our ears today, open our hearts to hear and to learn and apply your word to our very lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You into the Holy of Holies, as they would call it, before he was summoned, you're dead. But um, I think of when the people wanted to go up on Mount Mount Sinai, and then God said, "Don't let them touch, touch it, or you're dead." More like, you know. But now, through Jesus Christ, it opens up a door. We can go into God at any time and speak to Him. We can go into God and bring our prayer, and He hears us every time we pray. He doesn't say, oh, speak up a little louder. I can't quite hear you. Need to be on your knees a little longer. I can't quite hear you. He hears. Even if we say a little prayer under our, our voice, He hears it. Even if we whisper, He hears it. I don't care how soft it is, He hears it. So, as Esther walked into that, the king's countenance, uh, in this book or through the movie, either one related to that, they were going to, they were all accusing her. Look, she comes right before the king. She comes, should she? And she goes up the stairs and he extends his uh, rod out to her. And that was like saying, she's okay to speak before me. Just as like our God extended Jesus out for us, now it's okay they can come forth. See, Jesus is our rod. 
He's our intercessor for us. Right? Isn't that awesome? I get excited when I think about it. Because <laughs> he just loves us. He never gives up on us. No matter how many times Amen. we fail, if we get back up and say, God, help me, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep trying. He's right there. He'll forgive us every time. And he'll be right there to help us. He'll put people in your path even if you're really trying. It's unknown yes. who wrote the book of Esther. Let me get rid of this thing. Put my other mic on. But some think it might have been Ezra, and some think maybe Mordecai. It was probably Mordecai, but we don't really know for sure. Um, now, Esther, much like the book of Ruth, she is the star of this book, right? Star of the book. Matter of fact, Esther, that's what it means. Star. Um, and the Jewish name, her name was Adasa. And guess what that means? <laughs> Myrtle. <laughs> How can you? Myrtle. Now, who wants the name Myrtle? <laughs> Do you know what it means? She hates it. Well, um, that's what adoption, adoption means, is little. Uh, anyway, like the book of Esther, Ruth, Deborah in the Bible, Priscilla in the Bible, there was many women who God called, right? He called them for a role to play. He called them for a specific role. And if those women would have not allowed God to use them throughout the Bible, it would have went a different way. Now, <clears throat> I'm not saying that, that uh, the Jewish people wouldn't have been delivered if, if the women wouldn't have allowed God to use them, because God would have brought it about some other way. Right? God's God. He's not going to let his plan go unscathed. He's going to use whoever he wants to use. And if they will not allow him to use them, he'll use somebody who will. Amen. So you ever wonder why God called the women and not the men? Why, why did God call certain women in the Bible and not men? Now there's people, they fight with you over that. <gasps> well, women aren't supposed to do anything. Well, you know, what I read in the Bible, women did a lot. They did. And God called them. To do that. They have influence. Yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> Women have their own way, don't they? Yeah. When God wants something to happen, <laughs> women can bat their eyes, flip their hair. Yeah. And they do a lot to get things done. God knows that. Uh -huh. He knows yeah. that. Yeah. Now, I'm not making fun of, you know, but that's the way it is, yep. even way back then. Yep. And um, now Hahashira was the title of the Persian ruler, and his given name was Xerxes, and that's what we refer to him as Xerxes. But the, the way you pronounce it is Ahashura. Weird. Ahashua. <laughs> anyway, he ruled from 486. Uh, to 465 B.C. And history tells us that he was an impulsive ruler. He jumped the gun on things. It also tells us that he was quite uh, like a puppet on a string. He drank a lot. Yeah, he did drink a lot. He did. He drank a lot. And it, through the book of Esther, you want to note how quickly he gave up his queen. And you want to know how quickly he listened to other people. And this was uh, a time after the Babylonian, Babylonian exile. And many of the Jews, they still remained in this, this city, this emperor. They still remained there. They didn't go back. They remained in, in the city. And it was a purpose, just like the word says. Uh, Purpose and a plan. 
for such a time as this is when Esther was called for such of this time they didn't remain there for no reason at all I don't believe that anything happens by accident they were meant to be there I'm going to read from Esther 1 down to 4 from the New American Standard Bible. Now it took place in the days of Ahasuerah, that the Ahasuerah who reigned from India to Ethiopia, Ethiopia over 127 provinces. In those days, as King Ahasuerah sat on his royal throne, which was at the uh, city in Susa, now, some of your translations might say Suzanne, Shushan, and that's the way you actually pronounce the Susa, is Sushan. Um, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his princes in attendance. The army officers of uh, Persia and Media, the nobles, and the princes of his provinces being in his presence. And he displayed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor of his great majesty for many days, 180 days. Now, this was a big party going on. And this party, you ever hear about saying, I, I went on a week-long drunk? Well, this wasn't just the week-long drunk. Mike might remember some of that. That's a part-time. <laughs> hey, that's a part-time. <laughs> this is like six months here that he did a party. That was a big party. And this royal affair was for the purpose of, you know, getting together with the hobnobs, big knobs, and whatever you want to call them, and showing off the spoils of his plunder, of how he overcame this, this battle and won so many things. And look at this, and look at that, and I did this, and... I can imagine a man, you know, when they start talking about what they did, they get their chest puffed up, and look what I did, you know, and I did this, and I have to take all that. And then they start going into the detail, and you can care less about the detail. Us women, we don't like the detail. I just want to know what you did. That's okay. I don't need to know everything. So this banquet lasted a long time, and... Uh, he was celebrating his victory. He was showing off, in other words. You know, he was showing off. Um, and no doubt feeling like Superman. His pride got the best of him. Look at this. There's nothing that I can't do. I still feel like a cat, Mike says all the time. Honey, that cat's getting old. You've already went through nine lives, you know. <laughs> I feel like a cat. Smooth like a cat. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, anyway, 5 from 2, 12. When these days were completed, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days. Now, this is after the big banquet. Now he gets a little week-long drunk. So, seven days for all the people who were present at the uh, city in Susan. 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 <laughs> Susan. <laughs> Grace to the least in the court of the garden of the king's palace. Now this was in his garden. It was, it's more of a private place. It's, it's not like outward public can be. It's like more private. And there were hangings of fine white and, and velvet linen held by cords of fine purple linen and silver rings and marble columns and couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of, uh, I don't know what that word is, pavement of probably gold, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels of various kinds. And the royal wine was plentiful according to the king's bounty. The drinking was done according to the law. There was no compulsion, for so the king had given orders to each official of his household that he should do according to the desires of each person. In other words, he gave them the okay, drink as much as you want to drink. 
Now, Queen Vesti also gave a banquet for the women in the palace, which belonged to King Ahersia. Xerxes, I'll say. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded that his royal eunuchs, I'm not going to try to even pronounce those words, each, it named each eunuch. What's a eunuch? Castrated male. It's castrated male. So uh, they couldn't have intercourse, let's say. So he took his seven eunuchs and he commanded to go in and bring uh, the royal, bring Queen Vesti before the king with her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the princess, for she was beautiful. But Queen Vesti refused to come at the king's command, delivered by the eunuchs. Then the king became very angry, and his wrath burned within him. Now the Medes and the Persians were in power at this time, as Daniel had prophesied. And the feast lasted for seven days. Um, in the king's beautiful garden, like I said, it's more of a private place. And there was a lot of drinking going on still. And this says when the king was married, that means when he was soused. You know, snookered, whatever you want to call it, drunk. You know, there, there's in between, like, there's drunk where you're like. And then there's Mary, uh, like, happy go lucky when you're just, hey man, how you doing? But there's a process of becoming drunk. I think they were drunk. He was drunk at this time. He was ready to like bring off the women. You know how a bunch of men get together sometimes and they start drinking. They either start comparing what they got, their cars and baseball games and football games. And then once it passes a certain stage, then it goes to women and then it goes to, you know, uh, sex or whatever. But anyway, he was at a place where he wanted to to show off his trophy wife, trophy queen. So, now at this time, his wife was also having a party. Want to know why? Because usually men did not um, let the women come in with them. When, they, when the men had a get-together, it was just men. When women had a get-together, it's just women. It's more like when their culture at that time, men sat on one side of the church, women sat on the other side of the church. Okay, well, Queen Vesti was having uh, a banquet of her own. So this was a time that she could get together with the girls and sit and have her own uh, get together, her own party. Now, women don't usually drink and drink and drink till they get not usually. They might have, you know, a women's party, if it's going to be one of those, they'll have a glass of wine, that's about it. A uh, glass of champagne, that's about it. And they talk about girl stuff or whatever. But they can, don't get me wrong, they can, but not usually. Now, when the Enochs, when they came in, and demanded that she come before the king, she was flabbergasted. <laughs> well, I'm not going to go parade before in front of drunken men. Can you imagine? I mean, she knew how long it had been. She knew how long they had been drinking. She knew pretty much what goes on, probably. She wasn't going to allow herself to go before these men, leave her guests, was she going to leave her guests just sitting there? No. So, um, she knew that was no place for a queen to be. It was about like, be about like a well-dressed businesswoman of today with class and sophistication going into a dive bar. No, it's just something you don't do. It's, you just don't do it. We all know what happens when the much of men get together. And here's one thing that you may not know. 
Does anyone know much about Persian women? Now, Persian and Iranian go real close together. You guys know anything about Iranian women? Well, um, Anybody know what this is? It's a veil, right? Okay. Back in their culture, their heritage, they wore veils. And whenever they were in public of men, they had to have their face covered. Now, it could be that she refused to come before the king because she knew that that would mean that he'd want her to unveil herself. And these parties that they had back then before the kings, they also did a lot of weird dancing, and that's just the way it is. That's what they did. And they, some of the dancing enticed the men, right? He, it's not uncommon for, it, it's not in a weird place for me to think for some reason that this king would have not have asked her to unveil her face, not to mention maybe other things. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying. It's possible he might have wanted her to take her veil off her face. Now her heritage, she was brought up not to do such a thing. That to do that would be a disgrace to herself. So she said, no, I'm not coming. I'm not coming. Now, it could be some other reasons, too. could be that she was still pregnant. I think that that's kind of a weird one, but I found that in one of the, uh, one of the books, history books. But I just can't think of one that really makes a lot of sense except for that one. Now, if you're brought up to cover your face, yes, when you're out in public, when there's men, you're going to have your face covered. Because otherwise, it meant, you know, to them, they get beat if they're ever not fully dressed in front of men. Their husbands will literally almost beat them to death. It's it's not something I'm sure that they hide. It's just the way, their way of life. So when she refused, he got mad. Now, in the movie, it showed he got upset. But this king, Erxes, it was well known he had a fierce temper. And he didn't just get mad. He was furious. He was frustrated, furious. She was disgracing him in front of his noble officials. Now, when a husband tells his wife today to do something, and she doesn't do it, does he get mad? Yeah, mine does. The husbands would get a lot more done if they ask and say please and thank you. <laughs> Mike says do it, just do it. That's when I do the opposite. Now if he'll ask me, I'll bend over backwards for him. But if he tells me, that's a different story. Um, now it's heard that king, the king had a very bad temper. Have you ever met somebody with a real bad temper? That just blows? Oh, oh, it's horrible. It is horrible. And it was said at one time that he, King Erxes, that is, had a, uh, a bridge built. And after that, he took 300 of his men and uh, he had this bridge built. And after the bridge was built, this big storm came and wiped it out. And he was so furious that he walked out in the ocean, just turned his legs like that. 
take that ocean, take that, like he's going to do something in the ocean. Then that didn't satisfy him, so then he comes back and he has all 300 men heads cut off, decapitated. Now that's a temper, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I had to giggle when I read about him walking out in the ocean and hitting the waves because I'm thinking, that's the kind of little kid having a hissy fit. He loses self-control. Now, that's one of the best gifts of the Holy Spirit, I think, self-control. So a person that has a really bad temper, anger, is a person that has no self-control. They blow. They can't hold it back. Now, when you're drinking, why is, I think sometimes the reason why the Bible tells us not to become drunk with wine and not to like overindulge is because that's the first thing you lose when you overindulge, your self-control. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing we're supposed to have with being a, a gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, 13 through 22. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for it was the custom of the king, so to speak, before all who knew law and justice, and we were close to him, uh, and there's those names again, the seven princes of Persia, Media, who had access to the king's presence and sat in the first place in the kingdom, according to law. What is to be done with Queen Vesti? Because she did not obey the command of King Asherah, delivered by the Enoch, in the presence of the king and the princess. Um, Mimikin said, Queen Vesti has wronged not only the king, but also all the princes and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Asherah. Uh, for the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands by saying, King Asherah's commanded Queen Vesti to be brought in to his presence, but she did not come. So, they're saying to him, if you don't make a spectacle out of her, then, she, then all the women are going to look up to her and say, hey, look what she did. So now we're going to say no to her husbands every time they ask for something. This day, the ladies of Persia and Media who have heard of the queen's conduct will speak in the same way to all the king's princes. And there will be plenty of contempt and anger that means the men are going to get mad about it. If it pleases the king, let a royal edict be issued by him, and let, let it be written in the laws of uh, Persia and Medes. I'm just going to say the Medes because I've been Persian for the Medes. So that it cannot be repealed that Vasti may no longer come into the presence of the king Asherah, and let the king give his royal position to another who is more worthy than she. When the king's edict, which he will make, is heard throughout all his kingdom, great as it is, then all the women will give honor to their husbands, great and small. So they're saying, make a spectacle out of her, put her out of the kingdom, out of her title and everything, so that when women hear about it, then they'll be quick to obey the men. This word pleased the king, and the princes, and the king did as uh, uh, Mimikin proposed. So he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province according to its script, and to every people according to their language, that every man should be the master in his own house, and the one who speaks in the language of his own people. So he's so mad that his woman didn't come in when he asked her to, but he dethrones her, dethrones her, takes her out of the title, her position, kicks her out of the house. Now something that he actually killed had her killed, but I don't read where the word really says that anywhere. So I'm presuming that he just kicked her out, made a spectacle out of her. 
History tells us that he was a puppet on this journey. Why do I say that? Because he listened to the people. He listened to what the people wanted more than what his heart told him, more than what his own mind told him. He did what they wanted him to do, right? This tells me that she wasn't an actual beloved wife. She was more of a trophy wife. Because had he really loved her, it had been hard for him to do such a thing. It had been hard for him to put her out. And, you know, for her, I think she did what was best, what she thought was best for her heritage and her life. Because for her to do such a thing would have been going how she was brought up. So, his rage got the best of him. And listening to others got the best of him. What lessons can we learn from this chapter, you think? Well, I can think about three. You've probably got more. Uh, not to drink too much, right? <laughs> not to drink too much because you lose your control. You ever wonder why self-control is the last of one of the fruits of the spirits that's mentioned in the Word? It's the most important, I think. Well, not the most important, but it's vitally important to have your self-control. Because when you lose, lose a temper of rage, say, anger, people have been known to actually kill people murder people, and then go, how did I do? Because they've lost their self-control. Mm -hmm. well, he was a fucked up, proud uh, yeah. king. He and was... anybody could get him to change what he was saying because they played on the back of his. He was proud, fucked up, and thought that he was right in everything. He was, he was proving one way or the other. Mm -hmm. The crowd helped manipulate what they wanted because it was pride. Right. I always thought it was kind of a control situation too, where she wanted to be king. You think? I don't really know. Could have been. I don't know for sure. It was a power struggle between the two of them. Mm -hmm. That's what the movie made it look like, though. I don't know. Yeah, the movie made it look that way, but I don't know that that's true. I don't know if that's true or not either, but that's what um, I kind of think. When you watch, uh, sometimes when you watch movies of the Bible or whatever, you got to really back it up with Scripture because uh -huh. they add in stuff to make it more exciting, exciting and enticeable for you. So you I use the phrase based on a true story. Yeah, based on it. Uh, number two, listen to each other and respect each other enough to ask and say thank you. You know, if they truly love one another and it was a connection, you know when you got a connection with somebody, you respect them, you do your best to please them, you, you say please and thank you, um, you know, it, it's not so much about telling, it's listening to. You hear. And it's hard for us sometimes to really listen to one another. But we need to take the time to listen to one another. Not just listen on the outside. How are you doing today? Oh, fine. I mean, do you really want to know how they're doing? Because they'll go in to tell you how they're really doing. Most people don't want to take the time to listen to how they're really doing. They just say the words. How you doing? Fine. Are you really doing fine? Probably not, but it's quick, right? That's true because many times I've been up to about the first day and the nurses come out and they'll say, well, how are you doing? They'll say, fine, but you're not really doing fine if you're in the hospital. You know, you've got issues going on. <laughs> but they all say, well, I'm fine. But uh, I heard that, you know, just time and time mm -hmm. again. I said, how are you today? Well, I'm doing fine. How are you doing? 
And they asked me, and I said, not too good, I wouldn't be here. You know, like Joyce Myers, I get tickled at her. She's, she would say her and Dave would be in the biggest fight, and you know, right before getting to church, and they'd be battling back and forth in the car, and they'd be yelling and screaming at one another. <laughs> And the kids would be going, stop it, stop it. And then they'd get into church and someone asked them how they're doing. Oh, praise God, I'm just so blessed today. How are you doing, sister? Now, they're really not doing all right. They really just got in a big fight, right? But that's what we do to one another. We're really not doing one another any good when we do that because we're really not telling how the, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Yeah. There's an after part. You know. I always tell them, you know, I'm going to do it for the condition I'm in. <laughs> you don't want people to know what you really are either. Yeah. yeah. I don't care what they know I am. I'm saved by grace. I, I fail every day, but God picks me back up. You know? And, yeah. I think, too, you know, yeah. it might upset her because she was having a feast of her own. And, you know, she may have been doing some things for him to call her out just right away and leave. Yeah. You know, for her to have to leave her party, her party, you know, um, you know, it, it really, when you look at it, when you examine it, it's, it looks like two prideful people uh -huh. yeah. that, you know, yeah. are what not going to yield to each other, and truthfully, you know, I know as a king, probably, you know, in that culture, usually women didn't have any rights, mm -hmm. no. but, you know, as, as uh, married people, you know, we're never truly happy until we put the other person in front of our own mm -hmm. one. I mean, yeah. You know, and uh, it's one of those things that you have to work on sometimes because we are mostly self-centered. Uh -huh. yeah, we want true. what we want. And yeah. We forget sometimes that really to be truly happy, you have to consider the other person first. That's true. But, you know, like I say, it, it looks like she probably had her thing going on. She didn't want to leave, and so she said mm -hmm. no. And of course, you know, for anybody to tell the ultimate king, no, you know, who was he like? Well, you're not as important as you think you are. Yeah. Now, if we relate this king to our God, and, um, and she said no to our God, it would be like <coughs> so many people today say no. We were talking about predestination uh, Wednesday night. And, you know, um, I don't believe it's, it's God's way that anyone perish. The Word even says that. He wants everyone to be saved and go to heaven, but are they going to be? No. No. It's by their will that they choose to go the wrong way and not walk in the way the Word says. They choose. Right? Mm -hmm. So God doesn't want any to perish, but it's by their choice that they, they perish. Uh, number three, I had wrote down. You guys might have some more lessons you learned out of this. There's tons of lessons out of the book of Esther and Ruth and Job and all of them, really. But, uh, not to allow the crowd or the world, and I'm relating this to the nobles, you know, the drunk officials that gave him wise counsel. The Bible says it was, but they, it was more drunken counsel. Uh, don't allow the crowd or the world to influence your decisions. The Bible tells us to have wise, godly counsel. And all that means Christians, people who are saved, people who have read the Word, people who know the Word, people who are wise about Everything, then you know, business. If, if you're in business and you need wise counsel, go to a Christian businessman who can give you some wise counsel there. Um, many things. Any words of tidbit here or any thoughts? Any questions? Yes. When you brought that up, it reminded me of. Uh, First chapter in Psalms, which says, uh, Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, uh, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But it goes on to say, His delight's in the law of the Lord, but he's going to be like the trees planted by the river of water that won't weather when the, in the drought, and he'll be blessed in whatever he does. You know, but we don't, 
walk in the council of people that are not believers because right. you know they, they you know been. and that just reminds me how quick it is when we start walking in ungodly counsel how easy it is for us to fall back in our old ways because you know if you start running around with the crowd you used to run around with it's not long before yeah. you know we want to wear off on them but so many times it's not that way our flesh remembers our flesh from the past yes when they stood Christ before the multitude of people and they began to say crucify him Half of the people there didn't even know what they were yelling about. Yeah. All they were doing was going along with the multitude that yeah. wanted to crucify yeah. him. And the Pharisees started it all. And they knew when they started hollering crucify him, the bloodthirsty people around would do the same thing. Because half of them didn't know Jesus. And all they were doing was joining in with the crowd. And that's what happens to a lot of people in this world. They don't mean to do wrong, but they join the crowd. Mm -hmm. and my mom used to say, if, mm -hmm. if so and so would jump off a bridge, would you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, half of them would. Yeah. Yeah. Half of them would, yeah. yeah. Be a leader, not a follower. Mm -hmm. Be a leader. Best way to know how to be a leader, read the Bible. Do what Jesus did. That's a leader. That's how you can be a leader, not a follower. Uh, in, any other? Comments or questions? Was the king king of Persia or was he uh, king over uh, the city Susan? Yeah, city. yeah, he was over uh, Erxes. And they were over uh, uh, Judea at that time, or what? Uh, no, he was going into battle with Greece. He had just uh, come out of the Babylonian exile. Um, so he, was he Jewish then? Or? No, no, he was Persian. Well, he was Persian. Yeah. Yeah, Persian. Um, there was still Jewish people living in the city that he uh, was over. He had like uh, he had like four uh, homes, I guess you could say. And that was his winter home, and it was in Susanna. And then I forget what the others were at. I, I was going to say, my Bible in the footnote says he ruled over 127 provinces, yeah. but it looks like it's probably. And I'm not sure if that's uh, accurate. Uh, I know it says that here. But I think in some of Josephus writings, it's more like 28, 27, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the provinces consisted of, I mean, how big they were, you know. But he had like he, three he or four homes. Of Jewish so. No, 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 he, no, not they, the king. They were all heathens and had their yeah, own god. They, they had their own god, they were pagans, so to speak, but there was... The Jewish influence was in the city, and he married uh, uh, Adasa, uh, Esther. He married Esther, which brought the Jewish long in it from there. Well, she, he didn't know it at the time. He, not at the time. That, 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 that's when we'll get to the next chapters that we're going to be studying. He, did, he didn't know at the time, but he finds out later on. Anyway? Else? It looks like the map, according to the cities that they named and stuff, is probably about where uh, Iran is. You know, a good, yeah. a good share of it is about where yeah. Iran now, is. Now, now, it, now yeah. it's yeah. Iran, known as that. But yeah. Yeah. Yep. Could have been part of Iraq too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you look at the map, yeah. All the women exactly over right. there in the Middle East right now still have no rights. No. I know. Yeah. No, they haven't changed much at all. This is true. Uh, they, the husbands can, I mean, if they want, they can take them out and kill them, or they can just fish them out on the street if they don't want to be married yeah. to them. You know, it's sad, really. Yeah. 
Anybody want to close in prayer? Yeah. Dear Father God, we thank you for uh, sharing your word with us today, and uh, we thank you for your truth and, and your love for us, and we just thank you for allowing us to be here and together together, and, uh, and be encouraged by your word, and be strengthened by your word. We just pray that you would watch over each one this week as we go about our lives. Pray that you would use us to minister to others around us each and every day. And we just pray that you would uh, fill us with the fruit of the Spirit. Let us be uh, humble and, and uh, receiving of your love. Give the Spirit uh, free reign in our lives. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As always, if anyone is in need of prayer, I'm here to pray with you. If you don't know the Lord, today's the day of knowing. Don't forget about the flyers. Take some with you.